I think we should get going. So hello, everybody in person and everybody virtually. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to our second guest lecture. Uh, I'm really excited about this particular guest lecture. This is Alonzo Marco. Uh, he and I have known each other for, for many years now. Uh, he got his PhD working with the Planck Institute in Germany, and then uh, has recently started as a postdoc at, at UC Berkeley. And he's worked a lot at this intersection of controls and learning, particularly applied to robotic systems. And in particular, thinking about when you're dealing with data-driven analysis and control, how do you reason about risks and safety in the process of exploring, both in simulation, but also when you take something that you learned in simulation and bring it into the real world on real platforms. And so today he's going to talk to us a bit about his particular area of expertise, which is in the field of Bayesian optimization, and how you do this trade-off as you uh, explore a space. Uh, and with that, I will pass it over to Alonzo. Um, if there are questions from the virtual people, uh, I guess just speak up or say it in the chat. If there's questions from the in-person people, just speak up and then we'll repeat it into, into the mic for Alonzo. Um, Okay, great. So with that, take it away, Alonzo. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sylvia. So yes, any questions, please. Uh, you're very much welcome to ask anything you want. All right. So the, the talk today is going to be about Bayesian optimization. I'm planning to give an overview and talk about some of the possible applications of Bayesian optimization in robotics. So during my PhD, as Sylvia said, I focused a lot on, <clears throat> on learning control. And in particular, I, I tried to explore to exploit this uh, area of vision optimization and see what are the limitations and challenges when you wanna use it for robotics. Um, all right, so um, what we are trying to, what I, what we are, what I uh, cover in this lecture is essentially define what is vision optimization and, and there is no background required specifically for understanding this part. I'm gonna try to build it, build it up from the, from the bottom. And, I would like everybody to have like a running understanding of what is Bayesian optimization and when does it make sense to use it, like for which kind of problems we want we can use Bayesian optimization. And then also what are the possible uh, limitations that this method has and the current proposed solutions to overcome these limitations. And finally, um, I'm going to intertwine the slides with some uh, giving some hints on applications on green robot systems. <clears throat> All right. So, but first of all, um, I would like to I would like to start uh, by um, essentially uh, sharing with you some news that I stumbled upon last month. So, apparently, a group of researchers have managed to create an artificial intelligence algorithm to generate the third and the fourth uh, movements from Beethoven's Stan Symphony. So, for those that are not very familiar with classical music, Beethoven uh, Beethoven died before composing the Tenth Symphony. So. Um, essentially what these uh, composers did was to train a neural network with existing music and then use uh, sketch notes like this one that we see here in order to generate a piece of music that is uh, more than 30 minutes long. And we are so used to seeing in the news this kind of, um, this kind of successes of our artificial intelligence that we tend to forget how challenging it is uh, for a machine learning practitioner to actually get these systems up and running. And in particular, we tend to forget how difficult it is to fine to fine tune a neural network, right? For example, um, to make to make um, to make it generate thirty minutes of music. And so, what I want to really um, uh, talk about here is about how difficult it is to to actually come up with these design choices for whatever machine learning method we're trying to machine learning method we're trying to use, and how critical these design choices. Uh, are in terms of the performance that we end up having. So typically as, as practitioners, we need to come up with, uh, with um, particular designs, particular architectures that, um, that gives us the performance that we want. And in order to do this, we typically go through a trial and error process where we iterate on, for example, the architecture of the neural network, on the number of layers, on the number of neurons. And all of this takes a lot of time, right? <clears throat> so. For example, if we imagine something, uh, if we picture something a little bit simpler, like a neural network that, that classifies images, here we have um, a, a tremendous amount of choices, right? Like, uh, do I use one layer or do I use 10 layers? Do I use five, 10, or 15 neurons per layer? What is going to be my learning rate? What is going to be uh, my activation function? And 
all these uh, choices have an impact on performance. So if I wanted to pick the optimal choice, the brute force approach would actually be unfeasible here, right? Because trying each one of these choices individually means that we need to train the neural network and test it. And this can potentially take hours when not days. So um, we need to do, we need to find a way to kind of like um, in a more intelligent way solve this kind of problem. And it is not only about neural networks. Like we also find this kind of issue in robotics. Like if we wanna tune the low level controllers that are making a robot follow a particular trajectory, right? So um, we need to spend a lot of time iterating on a continuous space uh, in order to find the optimal gains. And um, this, is, this is typically done by hand by robotics practitioners. Like there is no standard method for doing this. And you typically use your intuition. And for example, here in this, in this jumping quadruped, we have four gains per leg. So um, if you wanna tune these gains manually, um, you're essentially searching for, for a, a particular gain configuration in a 16 dimensional space, which takes a lot of time. So we can talk about, about this kind of designs being expensive to, to convert to. And um, uh, apart from, from the world of artificial intelligence and robotics, we also, we also find these kind of challenges in other domains, like for example, in drug development, right? Like you wanna um, essentially find the chemical components uh, that are optimal for your drug, but then you need to go through human trials and test the different configurations of these, of these components on humans. And this is um, something that is expensive in terms of, for example, monetary costs. And there are many, many more options, um, but maybe um, to think about this on an abstract level, we can picture a piece of software where the design parameters X are um, essentially difficult to optimize. And um, in the case of neural networks, this could be, for example, number of layers, number of neurons, learning rate and activation functions. And I'm gonna assume that I have a way to measure the quality of these design parameters through a cost function. For example, in the case of a, of a robot, different gains are gonna, are gonna make my robot uh, follow a trajectory better or worse. So if the robot is able to follow it better, then the cost is gonna be lower. And what is important here is that evaluating this function is going to be expensive in terms of, for example, um, human expertise that is required or time or computational resources or monetary costs. So in a nutshell, what I have is a minimization problem where the function F that I'm trying to minimize, which is, this, which is my cost, it is actually unknown. So I don't know the function. I know that I wanna find the minimum, which is uh, depicted as a star here. And what I know is that collecting evaluations in points on my domain is something that is quite expensive in terms of, for example, time or resources, as we said earlier. So in order to tackle this kind of problem, we're gonna use Bayesian optimization. And this is gonna be the focus of the first part of the talk where I am gonna present essentially how Bayesian optimization work, works. <clears throat> All right, so um, just to recap, the main characteristics of the functions that Bayesian optimization targets are functions where the mapping from control inputs to real numbers is unknown and where collecting a function query is actually expensive. So, so in other words, we're dealing with a setting where data collection is scarce. In addition, F is possibly going to be non-convex and multimodal. The gradients are not available or it is prohibitive to, to acquire them. And this follows from the fact that evaluating F is um, expensive. We can also expect the numerical gradients to be expensive to collect. And finally, and very importantly, the function itself is actually not accessible. We cannot measure the function itself. The only thing that we can do is to measure a noisy version of, the fu of this function, which is uh, depicted here as a y of x. And we're gonna assume that this y of x, this ob observation follows um, a distribution that depends on the function and on the query point in such a way that if we were to um, collect many, many, many observations and then compute the average, then we would obtain the true function. And um, just to kind of like round up um, the, essentially the limits that we can consider or like what is the spirit of Bayesian optimization, I would like to compare this with uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is a method that is widely known and widely used in reinforcement learning. So uh, Bayesian optimization data collection is expensive while in a stochastic gradient descent is very cheap. That's why we can use it for model-free reinforcement learning where, where we have tons of data. 
Um, in Bayesian optimization, we don't have access to the gradient, while in a stochastic gradient descent, the gradient is a core element. In Bayesian optimization, we expect to find the global optimum, while in, in SGD, we are perfectly happy with a local, with a local optima. And uh, also in SGD, there is no prior information about the function. And in Bayesian optimization, there is also no prior information, but we're going to see later that we are going to assume a probabilistic prior that we are going to impose uh, on, on the model. And finally, the update rule in Bayesian optimization is, uh, is going to go through a proxy function that we call the acquisition function. Um, that is, is a utility function that is going to help me to select next point in my domain in order to um, maximize the information um, that I can acquire from, from, from the function in order to approach to the global minimum as fast as possible. OK, so um, essentially, now we're going to focus on how we can model the function f of x. And as, a, as we said earlier, the function f is assumed to be unknown, it's assumed to be a latent function, a latent variable. Alonso, and, we have a question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, the proxy function on the previous slide, mm -hmm. the alpha. Sorry. Mm -hmm. How does this differ from the uh, y of x, the noisy observation? Oh, it is very different. We, we'll see that in a minute. We, we, we'll see that later. So th this function alpha is constructed using two main elements. One is the observations, that's correct. But the other one is the probabilistic model that we assume on the function f. We, we'll see that later. Don't, don't worry about it. Any other questions? OK. All right. So, um, so yeah, we can essentially measure the unknown function using uh, my observations. And um, in order to acquire those observations, we need to run an experiment that is expensive, for example, in terms of time. So to model this function f, I'm going to use something that is called Gaussian processes. So um, Sylvia told me that not everyone is familiar with GPs. So I decided to actually explain in detail what a GP is. And um, I'm going to start with this graphical model and then continue with some visual explanation. So just bear with me. Essentially, um, what is important about Gaussian processes is that um, we assume that each input uh, induces a latent variable f that is, uh, is latent, so it's not possible to observe it. And this latent variable, in turn, induces an observation. And importantly, all these latent variables uh, for, a, for a collection of evaluations, all these, all these latent um, variables are connected through each other through a jointly Gaussian distribution, a joint Gaussian distribution, multivariate Gaussian distribution. And this is what actually gives rise to them to the Gaussian process, which is a finite dimensional object, but I can actually add as many points as, as I like. So this, this, uh, the dimensionality of this multivariate Gaussian can be as large as I want. And um, also what is important is that the observation and the latent function um, have a joint, Gaussian, a joint distribution. And if I apply Bayes' rule, then um, I, can I can make probabilistic statements about the function given the observations. And uh, by Bayes' rule, this is actually computed by multiplying the likelihood times the prior and divided by the, by the model evidence. So this is like a reminder for everyone um, in case um, you are not familiar or you don't remember this concept very well from your courses and probability. So the prior is something that we impose, something that we choose. The likelihood is something that it is either given by the constraints of our problem or that we actually model manually. And the model evidence is usually something uh, quite difficult to compute. Um, but eventually what we are really interested in is in the posterior. So I wanna, I wanna, I wanna um, use the Gaussian process to to, to try to say things about the posterior f given the data. So let me actually illustrate this with, with a visual example. So what we have here in the vertical axis is the function f, and the, uh, in the horizontal axis is the parameters, our design parameters. So um, here I have three observations. So the Gaussian process is conditioned on these three observations. And I assume that the observation is equal to the function plus some Gaussian noise. In addition, this thick line represents the mean of the process. 
So essentially the posterior mean of the process given the data. And this blue patch is representing the confidence interval um, that it, it is telling with a certain probability the functions that are actually, the function that is actually unknown is going to be contained with this, within this interval. And finally, uh, the um, wavelength functions that we see jumping around here are just possible sample paths from this Gaussian process. So they are essentially possible functions that are living with this Gaussian process. So one of these functions is going to be my true function. I just don't know what it is uh, a priori. Any questions so far? No. All right. Then um, something important here is that the predictive probability, the predictive density of a particular point X star is going to be greatly affected by the data points that are in my domain. So this point is having an influence on, on the density of this, of this, uh, of this of this particular location. And actually, if I keep adding data points to my Gaussian process, I see how the density gets, uh, gets changed. And this is great because this, this essentially is telling me that um, the data that I collect in, in a specific part of my domain is affecting um, the distribution at other points of my domain where I have no data uh, observations. And um, in particular, computing this distribution or this density is actually quite easy because everything is Gaussian. So we have a Gaussian likelihood, we have a Gaussian prior, and therefore computing this integral is something that we can do analytically and get an exact Gaussian predictive distribution, which is actually a luxury in machine learning. Like normally computing um, posteriors is usually something intractable. But in this particular very simple case, we can do it. And, um, and this is what makes Gaussian processes very easy to, to use and to manipulate. The problem is that uh, GPs scale cubically with the number of data points. And we will, come, we will come back to this later, but essentially just keep in mind that, that these operations are actually quite expensive to do. And um, so for now, the main idea to retain is that um, the Gaussian process is uh, something that we put in between the data points to compensate for the fact that we have data scarcity. We cannot collect a lot of data but we can assume a probabilistic prior um, that explains that data, and in particular, that explains regions where I have no data. And uh, this uh, probabilistic prior um, is encoded by something that we call the covariance function or the kernel. So the kernel is this object that I have here that takes two inputs and outputs um, a positive value. And in particular, the kernel expresses the covariance between function values at two different locations, x and x prime. So for example, if I use a square exponential kernel, which, uh, for which expression is, is written down here, I am encoding very smooth functions. So the kernel is actually speaking not only for the covariance, but also for the type of functions that I can expect in my Gaussian process. In particular, the square exponential kernels encodes functions that, that are differentiable infinitely many times. So they are extremely smooth functions. And um, what is important to notice here is that this kernel and most kernels that, that are used in the community are based on the distance between the points. And this means that two points, x and x prime, that are very far apart, under this kernel, um, the covariance of their function values is going to decay exponentially fast to zero. And this means that the data points that I have collected in this part of the domain are telling me nothing about the um, about the function in this part of the domain because they are too far apart. So what is important to notice here is that uh, the choice of the kernel is gonna greatly affect the generalization capabilities of, of my Gaussian process. And in particular, the kernel uh, is not just a um, black box math mathematical object. It actually contains parameters that I can tweak. And one of the important parameters is the length scale that encodes how fast is my function changing. And um, if I, for example, increase the length of scale, then the relative distance between these two points is going to decrease. And if I do that, then I am suddenly for the same data, I am encoding functions that are changing more uh, slowly. And suddenly this point has an actual influence in this other part of the domain. 
And the length of scale is not the only parameter that I can tweak. I can also change, for example, the, the, the prior variance. So if I increase it, then suddenly I am encoding functions um, that reach higher values and, and lower values than the one before. And in addition to this, for the same amount of data, for, for the same data points, I can use a different kernel than XOR exponential. For example, I can use a Matern kernel. And in this case, the functions as we see them are very rough functions. So they are functions that are, they admit only one derivative, they're differentiable only once. And because of that, um, um, essentially they are less smooth than, than the ones encoded with this exponential. And they, they are actually the preferred choice when we use Gaussian processes to learn dynamical models where we expect, where we expect to have uh, steep changes in the dynamics. All right, so um, it is typically said that Gaussian processes are non-parametric, but uh, we just saw that the kernel uh, actually contains some parameters, right? So how can, how can they be non-parametric? Actually, these parameters are actually, they're usually referred to as hybrid parameters and they're typically learned from data. So I'm gonna give very briefly three possible ways of learning these hyperparameters from data in practice. The first one is doing maximum likelihood type two. So in this case, what we need to do is to compute the model evidence, which is known also as the marginal likelihood, and then find the point estimate that maximizes this marginal likelihood. So essentially the question I'm asking here is what combination of hyperparameters um, creates a model that fits my data the best? And in the case of Gaussian processes, this marginal likelihood can be written analytically uh, as this, where the first term speaks for the model fit and fights against the second term in the optimization process, uh, which speaks for model complexity. So I want a model that is not too complex, but at the same time fits my data. So for example, um, this picture I took from the, from the book from Carl Rasmussen. And here, um, essentially they exemplify a, a certain GP um, where, the, where in the, in the x-axis we have the length scale and in the vertical axis we have the noise of the process and they are, try to, they are trying to find the combination of parameters that maximizes the likelihood. So in this case, what, what you would need to do is to run your favorite local optimizer in order to find the heel of this marginal likelihood. So this would be the, the most common and the standard choice. I guess the, the second preferred choice is, um, use, is computing the maximum a posteriori. So uh, this, this one is actually operates the same as the maximum likelihood, but we add a regularizer, which is actually a hyper prior distribution of, on the hyperparameters. And this distribution is something that we can choose on. Um, we typically add this regularizer where we have a lot of hyperparameters and we fall in the risk of, of, of our optimizer always finding corner solutions. So if we want to avoid finding corner solutions, using a hyper prior could be helpful. And for example, to give you an idea of what kind of hyper priors I could think about, um, if I want to put a hyper prior on my length scale, since length and scales are positive quantities, I could use, for example, a gamma distribution. And I can, I can parameterize as I want, um, but um, a gamma distribution is a good choice because um, it is only defined on the positive numbers. And finally, um, another idea is to treat the hyperparameters fully Bayesian. So I can include them in my graphical model and treat them as just any other latent variable. And if I do that, then what I need to do is to marginalize them out in the predictive distribution, uh, which is given with this integral. So the first term is Gaussian, and the second term is actually something that is difficult to compute, is the, is the probability of the hyperparameters given the data. So typically uh, computing this integral is intractable. So what we typically do is to approximate it by sampling from the, from the hyper prior. And then what we end up having is a mixture of Gaussians where the first term is a Gaussian density and the second term would be interpreted as the weight of this particular density. And this can actually be approximated using variational inference. So um, in practice, uh, when we do Bayesian optimization, uh, optimizing the hyperparameters is something that is quite desired because in this way, we don't need to worry about them. And then we can just let them be learned from data. Of course, these approaches, all of them have their, their, their drawbacks, right? But in general, uh, they're definitely something to consider. I mean, they're definitely much better than just fixing the hyperparameters. 
All right, so now that we have kind of like closed the chapter on Gaussian processes, let's go into the chapter of how does Bayesian optimization work? So um, let's remember that the goal here was to minimize the cost function f, which is unknown, and that this model with the Gaussian process and that collecting observations of this function is expensive, for example, in terms of time. So now uh, to answer the question that was asked, be asked before, um, we're gonna go to the explanation of this utility function, this proxy function, right? So, what I would really like to do is to design some utility function that exploits the information that I have from my data and from my probabilistic prior uh, in order to select the next data point in a meaningful way. So what is important to, to understand here is that we have uh, a setting where data collection is very scarce. So we cannot afford a lot of evaluations. And I'm talking about at most 100 evaluations or 10 to 20 or, or 100 evaluations. That's it. And within this um, finite number of evaluations, I need to be able to get as close as possible to the global minimum, right? So I would like to design the utility in order to, um, as I said, exploit the probabilistic prior information that we have um, to select the, data, the next data point uh, in my domain in a, in a meaningful way. All right, so one possibility for this acquisition function would be to, um, maximize the negative mean. And this is equivalent to minimize the mean, right? So uh, here we're trying to minimize a cost. So if I collect data points where my mean is uh, small, then, I mean, this makes sense, no? I mean, I'm doing something that I care about. I care about collecting low data points. But um, if I just care about the mean, probably I'm gonna fall into a local minima very quick. So this is actually not a good option. Another possibility would be to just explore, right? Like I can actually compute the entropy of the posterior distribution of a particular function, uh, of a, a particular function value, and then evaluate there. And why is an entropy an interesting, an interesting quantity? Well, because uh, the entropy of the distribution tells me how much information is contained in it. So if I collect data points where the entropy is maximal, then I am essentially collecting points um, where I can learn the most about the function, where I can collect most information. And because everything is Gaussian here, uh, this entropy can be seen as actually proportional to the posterior variance or the posterior standard deviation, which is the sigma. But if I just collect points where uh, the entropy is maximal, then I'm only exploring and I have no incentive of actually getting any closer to the global minimum. So maybe, um, an interesting thing to do is to combine these two things. I can collect points where I can, where I can uh, get close to the, to the minimum and also where I explore. And this algorithm is called upper confidence bound. Here we are minimizing. So, so I, I have essentially changed the sign um, to make it a lower confidence bound. And essentially this algorithm explicitly trades off exploitation and exploration using the beta parameter um, in order to um, at the same time, try to converge to the global minimum as fast as possible, but without, um, without um, forgetting that we also need to explore a little bit, especially at the beginning. And um, if I use this kind of method to collect data points, as we said earlier, then the idea would be to maximize this proxy function, this acquisition function, um, that um, it's essentially telling me that um, it's essentially telling me where to collect the next data point. So if I maximize it and I collect a data point at the maximizer and um, I continue doing so for a few iterations, right? I maximize and then I collect a data point. Then eventually I may converge to the global minimum. And um, there are many acquisition functions possible out there. Uh, this is just one of them. But what is important is that any Bayesian optimization method at the end of its, um, of its for loop is going to make a recommendation. It's going to tell me, okay, after these uh, n evaluations that you have given me, this is what I think that this is where I think that the global minimum is. And typically, we compute this global minimum estimate uh, by minimizing, by doing another minimization step where I minimize just the posterior mean of the, of the process. 
All right, so something important to keep in mind is that here we are optimizing an acquisition function, right? Which as you can see, can be really complex to optimize. It can be multi-model. Uh, so I need to be very careful when I, when I optimize it. So um, often something that we use is to, is to do random restarts. So um, in order to avoid falling into local maxima, I can restart the optimization multiple times and then pick the, the point that, that, that fits me best. Um, and I can actually solve this acquisition function using, um, using any local optimization method out there, um, any Newton method, for example, or evolutionary search. But something important is that evaluating this acquisition function needs to be something cheap. It cannot be something expensive. Um, and also the gradient should be available. And the reason for that is that Bayesian optimization only makes sense if the time that it takes to optimize this acquisition function is way, way smaller than the time, the time that it takes to collect evaluations on the real, on the real objective, right? Um, like for example, if we are tuning controller gains and it turns out that collecting one data point on my robot takes, I don't know, let's say five minutes, but optimizing this acquisition function takes 10 minutes, then I'm actually wasting time, right? Like, if I'm gonna do that, I'm just, I, I could just better do it by hand. So um, it is important that whatever acquisition function we design or we propose, it needs to be something lightweight and needs to be cheap to evaluate. And um, for the method that we saw earlier, this is trivially true, but it's not always true. So there are many types of, of acquisition functions that, that, that we can use. And um, some of them are more expensive to evaluate than others. So um, maybe it is good to maybe it is good to actually give an intuition of how some of the most popular acquisition functions work. Um, arguably, expected improvement, which is one of the oldest ones, is the most used in, and it's actually available in all the Bayesian optimization toolbox that you find out there. And it is because it is very intuitive and simple to understand, but also very computationally lightweight. So expected improvement operates by um, trying to optimize or trying to collect data points that are below the best cost that I have observed so far. So this eta is the minimum observation uh, that we have seen so far. So the lowest observation, and here we're minimizing, so lowest means best. And what I wanna do, so what this, what this um, acquisition function is trying to answer is where in my domain can I improve the best observation so far? So where in my domain can I collect a data point that is actually below the best observation that I have collected. And it turns out that this is actually very easy to formulate. Um, I just need to compute the expectation of the posterior distribution on F of, of this operator. And intuitive, intuitively what this operator is doing is to activate everything in my domain that is below this eta and setting to zero everything that is above. So I only care about everything that is below. And it turns out that you can write this down as an integral and that the solution that you get is actually something analytical, is exact, and is cheap to evaluate and the gradients are available. And this is perhaps the reason that expected improvement is arguably um, like the preferred choice when, when people use Bayesian optimization. But um, as I said earlier, like there are many other, other possibilities, right? Like upper confidence bound is the algorithm that we saw earlier. Thompson sampling is another one, and then entropy-based methods, like for example, predictive entropy search are actually also very popular, but they are more complicated to understand and more expensive to compute. So um, actually um, it has been already proven uh, many, many times that entropy-based methods are, um, even though they are more expensive to, uh, to evaluate, they actually perform better than the analytical methods. And um, in particular, Entropy search, which was like the first method, uh, the first entropy-based method popularly used in Bayesian optimization and after which many other meso methods uh, arise uh, over the years, is trying to answer the question of what is the mutual information between uh, the optimum that I wanna find and a new point that I add to my, to, my data, to my data set. And so in other words, what I'm trying to find is what is the point of my domain that is going to be informative or the most informative about the um, optimum location uh, of my function. And um, without going into too much details, because I don't want to waste a lot of time here, what I want to say is that 
this acquisition function is not analytical. It requires a lot of machine learning, uh, a lot of machinery and a lot of approximations. And it's also not cheap to, to compute. It actually squares with n, n to the power of four being n, um, the number of representative points that you use in your domain. But actually it is more accurate. It is more, it performs much, much better than the analytical, analytical methods. And um, if any of you is actually interested in knowing how entropy search works, I have a little video that I can explain in, 10 min in, in three minutes. And we can keep that for the end of the lecture. If you are, guys are interested, you can ask me about that and I can show you how it works. But uh, I think for, for, the, for, the, for the sake of time, let's just move on. All right, so- Ron, um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So you mentioned that the trade-off between the uh, deciding which method to use for the acquisition function and how long it takes you to actually sample uh, your underlying function. So if I had something where I just needed to do a five minute test on a robot, I would use an analytical acquisition function. Whereas if I'm trying to do like a, a drug trial that's going to take months, I would use exactly. more of an entropy based analytical. Exactly, exactly. Very good point. That, that, that's exactly what, it, what I meant, exactly. So if, if it is all based on how, exp so how much time does it take for you to evaluate your, your, your f of x. If it takes you days, then you can perfectly afford using the most complicated entropy-based method that you want, even if it is gonna take you a few minutes to compute the solution, right? The, the next iteration. Yeah, yeah. makes sense. If deciding then, what experiment to do takes more time than doing the experiment. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do we have any other questions? I guess if you want to touch on other non-optimizers for interpreters like Latin cubes. He's Latin. asking about something called Latin cubes. I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is? Latin cubes? Um, the Latin hypercube is, um, yeah, it, it is, it is um, I, I don't remember very well, but it, it is, it is a it is a standardized way. It is a standardized domain that you can use for benchmarking, uh, based on optimization methods across mm. or, uh, across each other. So, but I don't understand. Like, what is actually the the question? Like, okay. I was just going to say, do you want to like potentially touch on the difference that? What's the difference between doing that versus doing entropy? Um. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not very familiar with Latin hypercube, um, but uh, I would be happy to to discuss about it uh, offline. Um, I would say that entropy-based methods are right now the state of the art, and um, this is what I would go for if I need to use Bayesian optimization. I wouldn't do anything else. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, we're good. All right. Um, perfect. So. Now that we know or that we have a, a running knowledge of what is based on optimization, then I would like to give you some example about how to use it for controller tuning. Uh, so here we have the robot Apollo balancing an inverted pole. And what we did here is to tune the controller parameters of the LQR controller that is keeping the pole in balance. So here we were measuring the pole angle using a Vicon system, and then we were using the LQR controller to compute the desired accelerations. So we assume that the low level position control uh, loop was fixed and we were only focusing on tuning the high level control, essentially the, the parameters of the LQR controller for this carpal system. And um, this is a model-based um, controller, right? So we need some linearized dynamics um, of the carpal system in order to compute this controller. And in particular, what we were doing is to parameterize the, the diagonal elements of the Q1R matrices of an infinite horizon LQR problem. And um, by doing this, um, we were able to actually learn a better optimum using, using Bayesian optimization, learn a better controller. So, but what is important here is that we need some knowledge about the model, right? So what we did is to um, have um, a rough estimation of the, of the linearized dynamics of this carpal system, but because the entire system is actually very nonlinear uh, due to the dynamics of the arm itself, then the model that we came up with was actually not very good. And 
and we were not actually able to find any parameterization that stabilizes this controller. So what we did is to run Bayesian optimization to find the optimal parameters. And I hope you see the video well. So what, what I see, what we do here is to essentially run the, um, the controller with some initial parameterization that is not very good. Here in the right, I have um, two-dimensional tuning space. And um, I collect the first data point, which is actually very bad. So it gives me a very high cost. And what I'm going to do here is to run Bayesian optimization in this two-dimensional space to find um, a better controller. So the blue dot is what is suggested by Entropy Search, by the Bayesian optimizer, as the next data point. You see that it's moving around a lot. And the green dot is the location of the global minimum, the, the estimated location of the global minimum. So after 20 iterations, we compare the initial controller with the one that we learned. And we see that even though the model was incorrect, we were able to adjust the parameters using Bayesian optimization and learn a better controller. So this is, this is one possible, one possible um, way of using Bayesian optimization for controller tuning uh, that essentially removes any need of expert knowledge, right? Like you just need to sit down and run your optimizer and you're done. I mean, you need to have expert knowledge in Gaussian processes, of course, but not on, on, on tuning um, um, whatever dimensional parameter space on your robot. And we also, um, we also try to do um, these, um, we also try to run this Bayesian optimization on a slightly more complicated robot. So um, we use it on, on Hermes uh, doing a squatting task. So it needs to go up and down. And um, this is a hydraulic robot that has many more states and actuators than, than, than Apollo. And um, essentially we were facing a 60 dimensional tuning space. But because this is arguably too large for Bayesian optimization, we used some reparameterization to, to get this down to six dimensions. And in these six dimensions, I mean, without getting into too much detail, the initial performance of the robot uh, doing squats, which was very poor, was improved after doing Bayesian optimization by, by a lot only, on the, only after 20 iterations. And here we show that the controller is also robust again, against mild disturbances. So, um, yeah, so those are two examples where you can use Bayesian optimization for, for controller tuning on a real robot. And, and doing this is actually very challenging. Like setting up these learning loops is usually very challenging. Like you need to really um, find a, um, a nice way to communicate the robot with the optimizer. And, and it is actually not trivial. But when you have it done, then you can reuse this learning loop uh, as much as you want and, and, and have it as a way of tuning your controller parameters. So now I think it's worth spending some time on talking on the limitations of, of Bayesian optimization and some possible um, solutions to these limitations, to overcome these limitations. Um, so the first limitation is not about Bayesian optimization itself, but it's more about the fact that we are using Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes scale cubically with the number of evaluations that we collect, with the number of data points. And in particular, the predictive distribution at a particular location, which is Gaussian, um, requires us to compute the first and the second moment. And computing these moments requires a matrix inversion, where this matrix is n by n times n. And therefore, this matrix inversion scales cubically. And this is actually a limiting factor, right? That this means that I cannot use as much data as I would want to, right? So if we wanted to ever scale up based on optimization, this would be definitely a limiting factor. Um, so one possible solution to, to scale up Gaussian processes is to use the Karun and Lev expansion. So this expansion um, essentially um, defines the function f as a Bayesian linear model where the weights are Gaussian and um, I have some features that I can decide on. And the important thing here is that under some appropriate feature choices and with um, large enough number of, of, feature, of features, this function behaves approximately equal to a Gaussian process. And um, also what is important is that by, by having this Bayesian linear model, we don't need to invert um, an n by n times n matrix anymore. 
I can invert an M times M matrix where M is the number of features. And this is actually um, a very nice advantage of using this expansion because then suddenly um, my, uh, the moments computation is linear on the number of data points instead of qubit. So I can, um, what I can do is to fix the number of features to a number that is not too large, so that my computer, my, some number that my computer can, can, um, can essentially not have troubles with. And, um, and then I can afford just, you know, um, computing the posteriors using as many data as I want. Um, so for the feature choices, there are many possibilities, right? And a popular one is to use random Fourier features. Um, what we need here is to, is to have a, no, a knowledge, a notion of the spectral density of the process. So the spectral density is connected to, to the kernel uh, through the Fourier transform, and it's also connected to the to differential to stochastic differential equation. So without getting into too much detail, essentially, what I'm trying to say is that this spectral density is something that we can have access to, so we can compute it. And then um, the random Fourier features are something that we can just use uh, basically out of the box. Um, another possibility is to use harmonic features where each one of the features is a solution to the Laplace eigenvalue problem with Dirichlet conditions. And this choice of features was actually used in some recent papers to learn uh, a dynamical system um, where uh, essentially the, the Gaussian process was modeling the, the transition function and the authors were able to afford collecting many, many data points thanks to this kind of expansion. All right, so that would be uh, one possible solution. Another one would be to use sparse Gaussian processes, which are probably more popular. So the idea here is to use a number of M inducing points. And again, using these inducing points and doing some algebraic transformations, we don't need to invert um, the data matrix anymore. We can invert another matrix that, um, that is M times M. So we end up with a method that is linear in the number of data points. And computing these inducing points is actually non-trivial that requires, let's say a talk by itself. So I'm not gonna go into this, but um, um, we, can act, so we can actually use variational inference to compute them and then use these inducing points to compute the posterior without having to use all my data. And this has also actually also been used for learning uh, dynamical systems, in particular, the dynamics of a carpal system. And what we see here is um, the Gaussian process condition on some um, evaluations of the car position and the angle. And, uh, and then what, what these lines here are just sample paths from this possible Gaussian process. All right, so um, this would be the first limitation, scalability of the GP. And these are two possible solutions to overcome it. Another limitation is about how to optimize the acquisition function. So we said earlier that, that this acquisition function is, it can be highly multimodal. So we need to be very careful with how we optimize it. And one way of optimizing it would be to use random restarts. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, but now the question is how many random restarts do I use? Because if I use a lot, um, then I fall in the risk of, of, um, of uh, essentially increasing a lot the cost of computing this, uh, of solving this optimization problem. And then, Bayesian optimization doesn't make sense anymore. And if I use very little random restarts, then I fall in the risk of not finding the, the, the actual maximum of the acquisition function and then, and then falling into a local one. And um, maybe another even more important problem is, the, is that um, I cannot afford an input dimensionality that, that is very large. So typically Bayesian optimization is restricted to um, not more than 20 dimensions. And this also restricts the kind of problem that we can handle. And the reason for this is that since we are dealing with a scarce data setting, um, if, I, if I wanted to increase my dimensionality, the dimensionality of my input, then the sample complexity would grow exponentially with the dimensionality. So I would need exponentially many more data points to have a nice coverage on my domain. But since we can only afford a few data points, then this is actually not possible. However, um, there have been some solutions proposed in this direction, and one of them is use, using random embeddings. So random embeddings work under the assumption, and this is a very 
I would say, a strong assumption that there is some sort of effective subspace um, which has a lower dimensionality than the, than the actual dimensionality of my input space. And the assumption is that the function changes only in that subspace while it, it remains constant in the other part of the dimension of the in the other part of the of the space and we, we can see this very very easily with this, with this visual example so here we see that in the in the first axis in x1 the function is actually changing a lot so there's a lot going on it's going up and down but in this other direction the function is constant it's not changing much so running based on optimization in this two dimensional space would be actually a waste of resources right because um, uh, the second dimension is telling me nothing so in other words, the second dimension is not important while the first dimension is actually important. So what the authors propose here is to use a random embedding um, and optimize the function in that particular embedding, which is a, a subspace of the actual space uh, that also contains the optimum. Alonso, we have a yes. question. Okay, um, I'm going to break this into kind of two questions. The first question is, how important are the initial data points? How are they, you know, chosen and picked and how, how much influence do they have over the system? And then second, when you have data points that have error in them, uh, how do you handle those situations? So sorry, uh, but what do you mean by, what does he mean by the input data points? The, the initial, initial data. So they're the initial data points. Like, do you mean in the, when maximizing the acquisition function or? or? Yeah, for most of these that you showed, you had like, you know, three data points and then you were using the acquisition function to pick the next oh, one. How do you uh, even know where to begin? And how does that impact? Right, right, right. And, and the second question is like, how important is it that they are noisy, no? Yeah, how, how does noise affect? Mm -hmm. this? Yeah, so for that, so for that, I could actually go back to, to the actual slide. Let me, it's gonna take a minute. All right. So it is not important at all where you select your initial points. Uh, I would say. Um, so these Bayesian optimization methods, none of them are, are supposed to be sensitive to the initial conditions. I mean, in practice they are, right? But um, in practice they are, but, but um, for most of them, you have some guarantees that you're gonna find the global minimum if you collect enough data points. So if your initialization is too bad and you are unlucky, it only means that your convergence to the global minimum is going to get delayed, but it doesn't mean that you are not going to find it. And um, one important point about Bayesian optimization is that it's not, it doesn't work as any other local optimizer where it is actually important that you initialize close to your, um, to your maximum. So the, these methods trade off exploration and exploitation, and they're able to jump around in the domain. So they're able to actually explore a lot and exploration is something is, I mean, is the most natural way of overcoming um, getting stuck in a local, in a local maximum. So a local minimum. So as you see here, the points that I collect, right? They're actually being collected in very distinct parts of my domain, right? While a gradient based optimizer would actually, uh, would start collecting points that are um, close to each other they would not be able to jump around. So this is one of the nice things about Bayesian optimization, that it's able to jump around, therefore overcome this, um, essentially overcome the, um, the, the drawback of having a bad initialization. Right. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. And the second question, in general, noisy evaluations are not a problem because we are having them into account in the, in the, in the pipeline of the, of the Gaussian processes. So as we said earlier, um, let me see so we can recover that. So um, the observations are part of my, of my latent, of my graphical model, right? So Gaussian processes 
are actually specifically designed to deal with noisy inputs, to, sorry, to deal with noisy observations. And that's actually totally fine. Um, what it would be not fine is if the noise of my evaluations is, is as large as the variance of the function itself, right? <laughs> so we need to have a noise to ratio and noise to variance ratio that is appropriate. Um, so it should, be, it should be small enough, right? And normally for Bayesian optimization to succeed, the evaluation noise cannot be more than, uh, I mean, it, it should be like about 10 times smaller than the variance of the function itself. Makes sense. And then I have uh, one quick question about the random embedding that you were just discussing. Yes, let me go back to that. So is the reason why they do a, a random embedding because they don't know in which dimensions uh, it's moving or not? Because here it seems like if you knew that X1 was the mm -hmm. dimension, you would just explore an X1. Exactly, so that's exactly the reason. So in the paper, they have a theorem where they show that with probability one, whatever um, embedding matrix A that you use is gonna actually give you is, is going to make this equality hold, right? So, um, based on the assumption that they have that underlying structure, somewhere. yeah, yeah, based on the assumption that there is some subspace. So, if you don't know what is your subspace, and this is possibly something that you cannot know a priori, um, then using random embeddings could be could be helpful. Um, but yeah, like uh, they are random because you don't know them a priori. And and in the paper which is actually very interesting. I would totally recommend to read it. It's um, what they do is to do Bayesian optimization in a billion dimensions, right? So they, they pick, so they, they handcraft a function that has two or three dimensions that are meaningful. And for the rest of the dimensions, the function doesn't change, right? Mm -hmm. And then under those conditions, then random embeddings shine very nicely because um, they are able to find the dimensions that, that actually matter. Okay, thanks. Any other quick questions? Okay. All right, so and another solution for the scarce data setting would be to use variational autoencoders. So um, I haven't used variational autoencoders myself, uh, but, um, um, but I have seen it more, I, I mean, I see it more and more in the literature of Bayesian optimization, especially when it comes to to robotics or dealing with real systems. And the idea here, I mean, the idea of a variational autoencoder is to, again, um, reduce the input dimensionality to a latent or like uh, or a smaller subspace of a smaller dimensionality Z um, and then map it back to the original, uh, to the original space. And um, of course, if you wanna use this kind of um, machinery for Bayesian optimization, you first need to train your variational autoencoders. So one particularly great idea, uh, sorry, and, and um, what I wanted to mention is that then what you can do is to use the data that you collect to do Bayesian optimization in this lower dimensional, um, lower dimensional superspace. So um, one particularly interesting approach to training a variational autoencoder is to is in sim to real settings. Like for example, I want to I want my robot to to learn to walk from scratch. I want it to learn to walk from scratch, um, but I'm going to use a, a high fidelity simulator, so a simulator that is really good on resembling what the robot is going to do. And then I'm going to sample random trajectories from that simulator, and I'm going to train a variational autoencoder, where uh, I believe x and z would be the parameters of the policy. And now, one, uh, when it comes to transferring this policy to the real world, then what I do is to use Bayesian optimization to iterate on the subspace. And for each point that Bayesian optimization suggests, then I use it in the decoder to map it back to the original space and deploy it on the real system. And with this, what the authors did was actually um, transfer from simulations to real systems to the real robot in less than 20 trials, which is actually very cool, right? For this uh, Dexy hexapod robot that they have at Facebook. And um, yeah, so those would be, I would say two main branches that are now 
two main directions that are being taken at the moment, I would say, to deal with Bayesian optimization in higher dimensional systems. Um, and another interesting uh, question to, uh, to, to ask here is, how do I select the right prior? Uh, I would also classify this as a limitation, right? Because we are all the time saying that we are using Gaussian processes to, to uh, essentially explain some existing data. But in order to explain that data, we are committing to a choice of a particular kernel, a particular covariance function. And as we saw earlier, it's not the same using square exponential that using modern kernel, right? Modern kernel encodes rough functions while square exponential encodes very smooth functions. But a priori, I have no knowledge about the function itself. So whatever kernel I choose, I am imposing it uh, without knowing if it is the correct prior. So the question here is, can we actually construct kernels that are somehow informed about a pre-existing structure in my problem? And this is obviously very, let's say, problem dependent, right? Uh, for example, can I include the structure of my controller uh, when it comes to construct the kernel? Can I include the structure of the control problem in the kernel construction? And another question is, can I use the simulator to construct a kernel that um, actually reflects exactly what I, what I want to reflect on, on the cost function? And it turns out that, that there are a few things that you can do um, to construct kernels that are actually meaningful. Like, let's say, for example, that um, we have a very simple, uh, in a very simple case, we have a linear system with a state feedback controller, which is parameterized with parameters X that we want to find, and that we have a, a cost function that is quadratic. So um, in a paper that, 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 um, that, that we wrote and presented at CDC, we showed that it's actually possible to construct this type of kernel where the feature functions are actually um, including the information about my model and about my, and about my cost function. And this um, particular choice of feature functions are specifically suited to, uh, to learn, um, to learn the, the type of controllers that we find in, in, LQR, in, in LQR settings. So essentially, if my problem is linear quadratic and the solution is an LQR, then I can fine tune this, this, these parameters using this kind of kernel. And what we show here in these plots is that uh, if I were to use a non-informed kernel, so whatever standard kernel choice, then we see that the fitting is actually very poor, right? Like the gray line would be the true function and the red line would be the posterior mean. But if we use the LQR kernel, then because this kernel is tailored for this kind of particular kinds of functions, then the generalization capabilities are much, much better. So only with four data points, I'm actually able to close the gap in regions where I have no data. And this is actually very cool because we can use, because, because we can actually use this to speed up a lot based on optimization, right? Like there is no, uh, it doesn't make sense to evaluate here anymore because I know uh, that I have a very little variance. So I know exactly what's going on here. So that could be one possible solution on how to essentially use a more meaningful, meaningful prior. And another possible solution is to use a task specific kernel. Um, so there are some authors that have been, uh, have been using this for, for sim to real And in particular, what they do is to use the simulator to construct an, an informed kernel. And in particular, what they, what they do is to map the input space to another feature space, and then plug this into the kernel directly. And this actually very simple um, mathematical operation actually has a lot of nice implications. So suddenly, um, if I learn these features correctly, I can transfer from simulation to real robot in, in very few trials. And this is what they show, what Akshara shows here um, with this bipedal robot. So um, they were also able to transfer from scene to real in, in a few trials um, because they had a, a high fidelity simulator that they used to, to learn these features. So um, this, this kind of choices, you know, that they are not really inspired by any, any theory, any profound theory, I would say. I would, I would say that this is more like a practical choice, right? Like to plug here the features instead of the actual inputs. 
uh, but they turn out to work very, very well in practice. And uh, this has also been used for manipulation, for grasping tasks, and where similarly, the robot was pre-trained in simulation to grasp the objects, and then the adaptation seemed to real was um, only required a few, a few iterations. All right, and um, another practical issue uh, that, uh, that maybe is worth mentioning in is um, whether we can actually include the simulation in the Bayesian optimization loop. So I'm gonna talk in particular here about, about the sim to real project that, that we did. So the idea here is that simulations are an additional data source, right? And in general, they're very cheap. It is very cheap to compute a simulation because it's run, it runs inside, inside a computer, but they give me biased information. While real experiments, collecting data on real experiments on a real robot is actually more expensive, but it gives me exactly the kind of information that I want. It gives me unbiased information because I care about optimizing on the real robot, not on the simulation. So um, the question that we try to answer here is whether there is a way to automatically trade off simulations and real experiments using Bayesian optimization. And let me go uh, very quickly over the math here. So what we propose is a multi-fidelity Gaussian process model where the cost that defines the real experiment is to be explained by the cost that explains the simulations plus a term that, uh, that we call the reality gap. So essentially the term, the residual term that is left from the simulator not being able to explore, to explain the real experiment. And with this very simple structure, it turns out that we can configure a kernel for the real function, this k real. And this kernel is equal to the kernel that we use for modeling the Gaussian process on the simulator, plus the kernel that we use for modeling the Gaussian process on the reality gap. And in particular, we extend the input dimensionality using a decision variable delta. So this decision variable is zero if a point is collected in simulation, and it is one if it is collected on a real experiment. And what this decision variable is doing is activating or deactivating the contribution of the kernel of the reality gap. And in that sense, if um, any of the two points is collected on a simulation, then we are actually trying to fit the real fun the, the simulation function, not the, not the real function itself. While if both of them are a real experiment, then this term shows up and then we're pumping a lot of extra variants in the system to explain what's going on. And so let me, let me actually maybe uh, explain it with, um, with a visual example. Alonzo, before you get yeah. into it, we have a quick question. Okay. This is a quick clarifying question on Delta. Um, delta is only one or zero based on this previous sample point. For Still, it depends on whether or not the original point simulation versus the real. You're asking, does the delta depend on the previous points, or that is the is the delta yeah, analyzer? So some like kind of weird thing where like kernels are generally like associated. You know, that kind of delta term is not necessarily associated in, in, in the sense that. If you're querying, like you would do in a Gaussian process, to figure out where the mean is, you have to do the kernel inversion. Now you kind of have to keep track on, on, on kind of where that, if, if the original point was simulated or not. But if you're using previous learned Gaussian process stuff in a simulation, that delta is still there, even if the original data point was like, I guess we don't know. I'm not sure. Let me try to say what I heard. So you said yes. that mm -hmm. the the, uh, the delta, when you incorporate that into your simulated Gaussian process and you do the inversion, uh, does that show up in the real Gaussian? Uh, okay, why don't you why don't you yeah. ask him directly? <laughs> 
Yeah, so it doesn't it, it doesn't participate in the regression, I think, in the sense that you are thinking about. So we don't, I, I mean, if you, I, I think your question is uh, related to the fact that I am missing here a continuous variable with a discrete variable, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So no, it doesn't. It doesn't show up in the optimization in that in the in the in the posterior in that way. So what you end up having is your kernel. So we so first of all, we only care about the Gaussian process of the real system. I mean, it's not entirely true. We care about this one, and we also care about the kernel of the of the simulation. But but um, essentially. Um, the delta flag doesn't show up in the in the regression because um, we are using it here to pump in or out this extra variance term. So what you end up having is in, in the gram matrix, you know, the, the kernel matrix that you compute uh, using using the real kernel, um, you will end up having terms uh, in that matrix for which these uh, extra variance will show up and other terms will, will not show up. Um, but we are not doing regression, let's say, on, in, on the extended input space, including the discrete variable as part of my input in that sense. Does it answer the question? Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to know. Yes. OK. So yeah, so just to give a, a very quick visual example. Um, Let's say that I collect a point on the simulator, right? And I am trying to fit the, so the dashed line reflects the true function from the real experiments. And that's the one I care about. But because simulations are cheap, I might prefer to, to collect a few, a few simulations first. And if I collect one simulation, then what we see is that the Gaussian process of the simulator, which is the blue one, shrinks around that point because we have full information about what was going on with the simulator. But the Gaussian process of the real function, which is the red one, doesn't shrink around that point, doesn't shrink too much at least. And the reason is that there is a lot of variance that the simulator cannot actually explain. Because as we said earlier, it is less informative about, about, the, about, the, about the system. While on the other hand, if we collect a real experiment, then both variances shrink because this is giving me full information about both uh, the real system and what should be happening in the simulator. And this is all encoded using this kind of kernel structure. So to compute the posterior of the red Gaussian process, I'm using this kernel for which this term may or may not show up. And for computing the Gaussian process posterior of the simulator, I'm only using this kernel individually, like separately from everything else. And this kernel does not depend on the decision variable delta. Okay, so this was like a very rough explanation. Um, I hope it was more or less clear. I'm gonna now show a video um, of how we apply this on a carpal system. So in the left, we have the real system, which took about 30 seconds to, to evaluate, to compute the cost. And on the right, we have a MATLAB simulation of, of, the, carpal sim of the carpal, and this was actually much, much faster. So what is important here, and I didn't explain too much in detail, is that I want a Bayesian optimization criterion that alternates between real experiments and simulations, depending on what is more useful to do at each iteration, but also having into account that one is more expensive than the other. And uh, this is what we try to, to, to capture here. So on the left, we have the Gaussian process regression on the, on the real function itself. And on the, on the right, we have the, um, a two-dimensional acquisition function. And this acquisition function suddenly has two important terms. The first one is the expected change in entropy. So we're using an entropy-based method. So I want to collect data points where the, the, the change in entropy, which is also known as the information gain, where the information gain is maximal. But I'm dividing this information gain by the effort, the resources that it takes to, to do such an evaluation. And in this case, the, the resources are in terms of time. So it takes more time to collect a real experiment than collecting a simulation. So this T is going to be higher uh, if we are talking about the real source, and it's going to be lower if we are talking about the simulated source. And 
Here we see the acquisition function divided by the time for the real experiment. And here we see the acquisition function divided by the time, divided by the time for the simulator. So in this case, in the trade-off, let's say information gain versus effort or information gain versus, versus resources, the simulator wins. So it would be preferred to do a simulation for the next iteration rather than doing an experiment. And um, if, we, uh, if we keep collecting simulations, then we essentially get a rough idea of how, of the shape of the cost function. And eventually um, the optimizer decides, okay, it's now time to collect a real experiment because I know a lot about uh, how the function more or less is gonna look like. And in the trade-off information gain versus effort, in this case, the real experiment wins. So I decide to collect a real experiment. And it turns out that it decides to collect another one. But then it goes back to simulations. And what is important here is that this method does not uh, perform episodic, episodically, meaning first simulations and then real experiments. It actually goes back and forth between the two of them, depending on what is more informative per, per effort uh, at each iteration. And again, this is just a, compar a performance comparison between the initial controller and the one that we learned. And um, the important bit of information here is that by collecting meaningful simulations, we targeted only three real experiments, but those three real experiments were really well targeted. They were really selected at locations in my domain where we were expecting to collect a lot of information. And this is why this method is useful if you wanna uh, let's say include the simulation, the simulation in your in your base and optimization loop. All right, and just to finish, uh, to give the last example, I also wanted to mention another branch of Bayesian optimization, which is optimization with unknown constraints. So here, the goal is to minimize the function f subject to uh, some constraint satisfaction. But we assume that these constraints are not known a priori. So we model them using Gaussian processes. And evaluating these constraints um, also requires going through an expensive experiment and a noisy, a noisy evaluation. So now the acquisition function, this proxy function that we mentioned earlier, alpha, is going to use not only the Gaussian process of, of the function, but also the Gaussian process of the constraints. And um, we apply this for uh, a robot uh, learning to jump as high as possible. So here, x is the controller parameters. And the cost is the negative height. So we want the robot to, to reach, um, um, like um, to jump as high as possible. But we have a hard constraint, which is the current. Uh, the current of the motor should not be too high. And of course, the higher the robot jumps, the higher is gonna be this current. But if this current is too high, then there is a safety mechanism in the motors that has, is gonna make them shut off in order to avoid that they burn. So it is important that we try to keep these constraints um, below the threshold as much as possible. So what we do here is to run Bayesian optimization, again, where the initial controller gives us poor performance, and then we start doing iterations. But uh, before we, we essentially continue uh, debating on this, let me actually give a hint of what's happening here. You saw a failure, right? So we are not, this is not an algorithm that prevents failures at all costs. And the reason for that is that we believe that by allowing a few failures in your system, when those failures are not, are not too critical, you can actually find better optima. And this is actually something that we not only believe, like we have actually proved it. And I recommend that you check the, the a recent paper from ICRA, from Dominic Bauman. It is an algorithm called GoSafe, where we actually show, we give guarantees that, uh, um, by allowing a few failures, you can actually um, find better optima. And finally, um, this is just a comparison between the initial parameterization, the manual tuning that an expert did, and the one that we achieved with our framework, which was better than the manual tuning. And this took in total like about 50 iterations, and we incurred in some failures, but I think it was less than, it was like about five, five to 10 failures. And um, yeah, so let me recap in this last uh, 
four to four minutes. So when should we use Bayesian optimization? Um, Bayesian optimization is uh, something very useful in, in settings in which data collection is expensive and where gradients are not available. But of course, it comes with some limitations. The first one is the sample complexity, which increases with dimensionality. And we have proposed a few ways of actually reducing the input dimensionality via random embeddings or by variational autoencoders. In addition, uh, there are other, there are actually some ways that we can scale down the complexity of a Gaussian process from cubic to, to linear using the current and left expansion or using a sparse GPs. And finally, uh, the fact that the prior is uninformative is, um, I think, an open branch of research, which I'm actually very interested in. And we have proposed a few existing solutions. One of them is to include the controller in the construction of the kernel. And the other one is to use a task-specific kernel that uh, uses the simulator of the robot to construct it. And finally, we have also shown that Bayesian optimization can be used in some real world robotics applications. One of them uh, in tuning the robot controller parameters and another one in sim to real where um, we use Bayesian optimization for, for fine tuning on the real system, on the real robot. And finally, I didn't get too much into detail, but it can also be used for, for system identification. And with this, I would like to conclude, uh, but first, um, I mean, I can share my slides later if you want, and then you can take a look at these resources, which are just some um, programming toolboxes for Gaussian processes for Bayesian optimization. I would recommend that you take a look to BO Torch if you wanna, let's say, get started on Bayesian optimization. And NLOpt is the toolbox that I have been using for maximizing the acquisition function that has been working greatly for me. And if you want to also generate these animated Gaussian process samples, you can take a look at the technical report from Philip Hennig, where he explains how to do this. And he also provides some examples in MATLAB. And finally, um, I have used um, a huge amount of literature to construct this, to, to make this talk, but I think these are the most important ones. And I would totally recommend that if you are interested in this topic, you read, uh, these papers because they're going to be very helpful for you. So with this, I would like to thank all of you for listening to me. Uh, also, thank you for the questions. Thank you for, thank you, Celia, for inviting me. And also thank you to my funding sources.